Good day. I am in the Performing Arts Research Center in the Theater Academy Helsinki. Part of this comprising the Theater Academy, Sibelius Academy, and the Fine Arts Academy. Not the same as Aldo University, although we like them very much too. <clears throat> so what this is is a very quick and uh, compressed nutshell version of my dissertation, which is in its final stages. So bear with me a little, it's quite compressed. Uh, what I'm doing is artistic research. I come from an artistic practice that uh, uh, deals with sound in various ways, uh, not at the sound focused, but somehow always sound oriented, if you will. And uh, artistic research, you, you may be familiar with that term or some of its siblings, practice based research and so on. Uh, I would describe artistic research as uh, research where artistic practice has equal weight to theory and can question theory, and there's a dialogue between practice and theory. Not only in the common direction of theory or issues informing practice and dictating what practice should take, uh, what forms practice should take, but also the other way around. And uh, so I've been doing different kinds of sound uh, oriented hybrids from sound sculpture. This is bronze, has strings, a piezo mic, you can play it. Uh, this is a device that plays the guitar uh, sort of automatically. Uh, this is from my artistic component in, in the dissertation, uh, uh, an essay film about Tölön Lahti, the central area in Helsinki, the central bay in Helsinki. And uh, this is a, a theatrical art sport thing where the Hockey sticks could be played as guitars. They had wireless transmitters and strings and pickups and everything. And they were on all the time. So when you played hockey or bandy or whatever, you could hear it. And also, when you score, you have to play. So what those are, in, in my opinion, are hybridities. Uh, uh, what, what hybridities are, are togethernesses. There, is, there are different aspects that come together in one event or object or something. And uh, in trying to form a theoretical language to understand these hybridities better, I found that the concept of music is an obstacle. Uh, in my case, the labels music and non-music tend to apply simultaneously. That doesn't make any sense. And the concept of music doesn't seem to be suitable for, for this situation. And I'll, I'll get back to that in a minute. But first, what I mean by togetherness, uh, it's not just a formalistic thing. Uh, formalism would be this level, the level of the puzzle pieces, the creative expressions or art forms. But what that is is only an instrumental level the actual togetherness is social. So when we speak, speak, uh, speak of formalism of the togetherness of art forms, it's really togetherness of people that we're talking about. And if we consider every human being to be creative, then we're, not talking, uh, we're talking about nothing less than the togetherness of humanity. When we talk about the togetherness, formal togetherness of art forms. A uh, theater company, for example, is a micro-society that in, in its organization kind of declares or even prophesies uh, what society should be like or could be like. Uh, this is how we are together. This is how everything else could be together. Um, so so uh, what does the way we conceive of things at this level at the formal level, what does it say about what we actually believe, may not say it, but actually believe about the togetherness of the hands, of the social, the social level? Are we uh, actually authoritarian and not confessing it? Are we democratic? Are we ad hoc or a flash mob? Or are we a bunch of solo projects that avoid conflict? 
for fear of escalation. So a problem that I found in the concept of music, getting back to that, is that, um, well, actually I need to, you're probably familiar with Lockoff and Johnson's metaphors to live by. Uh, if not, I like it. You probably will like it too. It's, all, it's been around. Uh, the way we conceive of things they call a conceptual system and it manifests as talk and action. And uh, when, uh, when we have music here in the conceptual system, the concept of music, I don't mean singing or playing instruments, the, the actual concept, uh, we have this problem. There is no definition of music. I believe Luciano Berio and Jean-Jacques Nathiez were, uh, hit the nail on its proverbial and real head when they said that music is only that which we call music. So what is it really? It's not, there's no definition of music. Music is a definition. It's a sticker that's put on something and it's therefore maybe not necessary. And what that is really is a dogma. Uh, the dictionary definition would be for a dogma would be a principle or a set of principles laid down by an authority as incontrovertibly true. Obviously a human authority, not gravity or barking dogs. Uh, although that's a human, okay, <laughs> human act, okay, affecting us. Uh, a dogma, uh, as a setting, a dogmatic setting, is a one-way structure, a social structure. Uh, Augusto Boal, the Brazilian director and activist and uh, educator, would have called it a monologue, an oppressive mode, not a dialogue, which would uh, be an empowering mode. Uh, music as an adjective doesn't mean singing or playing instruments. It didn't mean that in ancient Greece either. Uh, I mean, uh, especially in ancient Greece, it didn't mean that. It meant uh, it was an adjective and musique techne, the latter word where we get technology and technique, meant the actual stuff. And it was nothing unless it was deemed music or musical, inspired by the muses, so to speak. That's a dogmatic religious definition, not a perception named by a contestable descriptive concept. And this shows in how Western ethnomusicologists call things music, even though the peoples they study may completely lack a corresponding concept, as was the case, for, uh, as was the case in pre-colonial Africa. Uh, I may have a slide for that. No, <laughs> I didn't. Uh, anyway, this Kenneth Gorley, 1994, wrote about this very rare ethnological article. Um, what that is, when, when you land in Africa and say, what you call a social event, we call music, and therefore I call it music in my research, is, uh, says more about the ethnomusicologist than the actual culture study. And if, if uh, such dogmatism is taken into its logical conclusion, and now as a former Finnish Canadian, I, I don't mean to say anything bad about Canada, but the Canadian composer celebrated to a very wonderful composer, Armory Schaefer, has professed this uh, totalitarian vision in his Tuning of the World, 1977. Uh, today all sounds belong to a continuous field of possibilities lying within the comprehensive dominion of music. Comprehensive and dominion leave nothing out. Behold the new orchestra, the sonic universe, and the musicians, anyone, and anything that sounds. That doesn't leave anyone out either. So, in this vision, which is a Wagnerian, Pythagorean vision, music of the spheres, the universe is music, yada, 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 you're a musician, and the one who calls you a musician doesn't care if you like that or not you're going to do as the composer says. Not a fun social structure, not an empowering one. Uh, and uh, this is why we have shunned Gesamtkunstwerk, a Wagnerian idea of uniting art forms, leading to this. 
it's oppressive. Let's stay in our solo projects and, and be a, a manageable piece, sort of. So with the concept of music, can you warn me if I near the end of 20 minutes? Oh, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so with the concept of music, we have two options. One, a fragmented world of disagreement where different definitions of music clash. Maybe not always you can live your life without having a serious problem here, but such, such clashes are, are inevitable and this describes the history of Western music really. And, and explains my situation, hybrids being troubled music, non-music hybrids. And our second option is a totalitarian unity. But what about the third option? If music is whatever we call music, there is a third option calling nothing music. What would that be? We haven't done that in thousands of years, probably, depending on where you are. In Finland, maybe a bit later, we didn't write anything before the 19th century, I think. No, 16th, but anyway. A fairly oral culture. Um, but when you, uh, I tried to find a conceptual history of music, a real, uh, what do you call it? The Griebsgeschichte, as the Germans who pioneered conceptual history would call it. And I couldn't find one. They all start with, okay, the dawn of time, people played bone flutes as the beginning of music. That, that's a bunch of bullshit. <laughs> they didn't call it that. They called it <clears throat> or something. <laughs> and and the, the word concept music came along when they decided to worship muses and idealize women and oppress women at the same time with the help of these idealized feminine goddess figures. So, so when did that happen? Sometime during archaic or ancient Greece, I'm not sure. And there might maybe earlier precedents in, I don't know, Babylon, Hurrian cultures and so on, but I'm not an anthropologist, I don't know. But anyway, uh, with my limited understanding, uh, I could tell that there's uh, the option Kenneth A. Gorley mentioned, pre-colonial African languages. And then with Google Translate, you can find out that Armenian has very strange words that don't share the music transcription as almost every other language does. Even in languages like Hebrew and, and Arabic, they have loaned the word music. And uh, this hasn't happened in Armenian. It's weird. It, uh, it has roots in Hurrian, which is way more ancient, ancient than, uh, than ancient Greece, so maybe there's, if you speak Armenian, come talk to me. Uh, a third option is to trace a, resist, a resistance uh, to Hellenization. Where uh, Hellenization was resisted, maybe there's a different conceptual system in play. And uh, the Maccabean Revolt would be one clear example. It divided the, the Jewish nation at the time also, but there, there was a very, very pronounced opposition. So, do ancient Hebrew concepts before the word musica was loaned into Hebrew around a thousand years ago, do they present something that's a different conceptual system? And. Uh, this was a way easier one to check than pre-colonial African languages or Armenian. There are uh, lexicons, uh, uh, departments of theology and, and religion are full of resources for this. So I found out that there's no music in the Hebrew Bible, and actually no, not in the New Testament either, but uh, here uh, the words translated as music, CK in the old translations, are actually very, very concrete, and they have no value judgment, and they have no religion in them. They're pretty primitive and con uh, concrete. Even uh, the word shir uh, comprises, uh, in the proto-Canaanite script, uh, shin is, is two front teeth, yud, the uh, middle letter, is an arm, and the uh, esh, the last letter, is a head. So what you see, it's someone singing, sort of. I'm just imagining that no scholar has, no Hebrew scholar has said that. So. Um, and these, these concepts are 
are very metaphoric. Uh, Zemar, I think that might be Aramaic, uh, has cognates because of the root system in Semitic languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, Arabic, and others. Uh, you, you find a conceptual cloud, if you will. So, wow, still five minutes. <laughs> I'm amazed. I can breathe a little. Uh, yeah, Zemar is uh, both singing and playing stringed instruments, apparently. The way it's used tells you that. And, and it's also a similar verb is to prune a vine, for instance. And as a noun, there's a kind of gazelle, probably, that we've seen. And uh, if you've seen a deer or a gazelle jump, there's a plucking motion, almost plucks the, the ground. And then you may pluck an instrument, you may kind of pluck when you prune. So it's a very primitive movement descriptive word. It has no religious con content. Say, uh, and, uh, and also shir is used, whether it's a god of another nation or Israel or a bird or, or a mocking song or whatever, it's still a shir. So these are very pragmatic concepts. And this is what clashed, I believe, with Antiochus IV in the uh, Hanukkah story of the Maccabees, uh, Maccabean Revolt. You, uh, there's no music in this. You cannot put uh, an emperor as a god if you look at him pragmatically, like you're, you're a guy. We're not gonna worship you, right? And, and then and this clashed with a mentality like this. I mean, uh, the, the Hellenist abstract, uh, abstraction, ideal, the idealization crashed, uh, clashed with this uh, very concrete and metaphoric conceptual system. Um, so <clears throat> would that, uh, in other languages probably, in English also, one can find these concepts to play a guitar would be the Zemar, to sing is the, is the shira and so on. They, they don't have a religious content, but then calling them music would dogmatize the situation. So what would happen if we ditched the dogma? Uh, I would suggest that instead of defining things, we would describe them. And what happens then is what I call this has openness at both ends, and you can contest. You're not even talking about that, or the way you call that, I call like this. And then what happens is we, we have a triangulation, which could be called translation also. I call that a laptop, you call it a Mac. We need a translation in between. Or I call that a guitar, you call that depending on your language, and then we need a translator. But it's open and, and communication happens. Uh, and it goes towards a purpose-driven uh, aesthetics. Why are we doing something instead of what we are doing? No, uh, the ontological status of things is not as important as why we are doing what we're doing. And throughout human history, uh, this has been uh, a very central why. Uh, I forget what royalties got married here. William and Kate, perhaps. Uh, I forgot to write it down. I just Googled wedding. But uh, uh, you can see it's the world coming together for a royal wedding. And there's nothing abstract about this. A wedding party or world is doing a wedding and the many different aspects preparations, the performances, the speeches, the rituals or whatever are brought together in the singular purpose of the, the wedding couple. And with a dogmatic conceptual system that, that would not compute, it doesn't give a reason, it just is, it's dead, it's static, this is here, it's still. So if we don't call it music, it becomes instrumental, 
uh, in a new sense, not, not in the sense of having no vocals, but in the sense of like, what is the singing and playing done for? An instrument, if you will, for? Is it for dance or having fun or relaxation, meditation, worship, social signals, language even, like the talking drums in Africa, or the bird whistling language in uh, the Spanish island of Mallorca? Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.